Good morning, Lucas. Um, good, good morning, Prof. Mm. Um, tell me, um, who, who is uh, Archbishop Tabu Sosomahova? Um, that's very. That's a difficult question um, because it pours into who I am, and I was raised by a grandmother who used to say, uh, "My child, don't speak about yourself. You are more beautiful if others speak about you." But uh, let me respond to the question. Um, I um, first and foremost a priest in the Church of God, and. Uh, I was raised uh, in both Makhovaslouf uh, in Limpopo. Uh, what is brag that Makhovaslouf is the most beautiful part of this country. Pity we don't have the sea. And I was also raised in Alexander Township, um, just uh, in Johannesburg. I come from a family of uh, five, and uh, from what they call the Royal Makhoba uh, uh, family. Um, in, 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 in Limpopo. Possibly if I wasn't a, a priest and full time in the church, I could be spending most of my time as a chief uh, uh, in the village, uh, again, uh, ordering the lives and affairs of, of the people uh, down in Mahobaskliff. So uh, that is it in summary. I'm married, I've got uh, uh, two teenagers and uh, my wife, Lungi, was in marketing, uh, but at the moment um, she's a full-time mother, uh, but has got more interest on uh, food security and the, the care of the environment. Uh, she's currently at the United Nations, um, where the Millennium Development Goals are being discussed. So that's it uh, in summary. You, you indicate that you made a choice between the traditional service route to the priesthood. Mm. What, what propelled? What were the, the levers in that decision? Mm. Um, it, it's, well, well, I was born into, into, that, into that family, and um, the, the, the choice of getting into the priesthood initially was between whether I go into the priesthood or I join um, Kondo uh, really, um, because a number of uh, my friends then were taking up arms, uh, skipping the country, uh, bringing about um, uh, uh, democratic South Africa uh, via the military route. And so those were, were, were the tensions. And so when the tensions came, the choice of going back home um, uh, within the traditional uh, leadership system became very pale mm -hmm. because um, most people will remember that a number of controversies uh, where people uh, hid uh, in, in Limpopo, uh, which was not far from um, um, Mozambique, and most of them hid uh, in the forest in Mahobas Clue. So uh, home was dangerous uh, mm -hmm. to go back to. And so, um, as an Anglican, and uh, whose leader then was um, Father Desmond Tutu before he became uh, famous, uh, his leadership style, uh, his courage was much more appealing um, uh, to us. And you'll recall that Oliver Tambo uh, is an Anglican. Uh, he went to an Anglican school. He was an Anglican teacher at St. Peter's. And so within the Anglican Church, there were these strong uh, political uh, leaders uh, who embodied their faith. So that appealed more than any other thing then. So from what you're saying, mm. that, that there was the, the traditional service. Yes. It's the priesthood. Yes. And there's also mm. the, the broader liberation struggles of African countries. Yes. Where, yes. Um, joining or not joining. Yes. What, what were the tools that you used to mediate mm between mm. those three very mm. important uh, from mm. birth mm. to what society requires, mm. to what the mm. liberation mm. movement requires. How did you mm. mediate between those mm. three different mm. 
Um, so, uh, yes. Should I ask again? Yeah, no. Okay. Um, it's, you, know, you know, it's a discernment that, um, that continues. Um, you know, when we went to college um, to, to be formed as priests, some people will tell their story that uh, I felt God, uh, you know, grab me the scruff of my neck. And then some will say I saw a lightning and some will say, I saw a snake or I nearly died. You know, very, very dramatic things. And I used to feel bad at college because I didn't have a dramatic story. And they used to say, uh, how did you respond? I mean, I used to tell them that I just enjoyed the, the processions in church. I mean, I saw uh, Desmond Tutu wearing his church clothes and processing and there'll be beautiful music. Uh, the servers will be there. So I just enjoyed uh, the order within the Anglican Church. But the deeper thing was now, if I can take this order and then go and leave it out uh, in, in South Africa, because the Anglican Church then was starting to have integrated parishes, particularly St. Mary's Cathedral in Johannesburg. And I said, well, this is the non-racial South Africa uh, that we want. And then the last, the other milestone was uh, when I was the president of the uh, Anglican Student Federation. The, uh, I was arrested uh, in the border of Lesotho and uh, detained in um, Lady Brent um, uh, for, for the whole day, then, then released in the middle of nowhere to say, okay, go. So I didn't know whether the border was left or home was, was right, so completely uh, disoriented. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was 16, because I was uh, tall and thin, uh, before having uh, the dumb pass, uh, carrying my books to school, um, I was arrested again by the police, uh, thrown into uh, number four jail in Johannesburg. And I think all, uh, uh, and then so again, again in 1977, in Alexander Township, going to school, uh, chased by uh, a Casper, and uh, it nearly ran over me. I went under um, a car with an Alex mechanic, and who was very brave, and he said, uh, you should be arresting thugs and leave this uh, school kid. And uh, you know, those Afrikaans boys said, school kid, I mean, he's dressed in school uniform, but he's not a school kid, he's a terrorist. So I think those things, um, um, uh, when the time when I had to approach my, my, my bishop uh, came, I sat down and looked at it and said, I think there is the hand of God somewhere. Not dramatic, but I could have died. I could have been arrested. I could have vanished. I could have joined Mkonte with Caesar, um, but um, I have not. So what am I being called to do and to be? And then I went to, to my bishop, who then said, no, don't do theology. Just go and do anything but theology. And if you still feel the same, um, I come back. I don't want you to run away from life's uh, decision and join uh, the church because you're running away. So I went and did a BSc degree, uh, finished the BSc degree, went back to the church. Desmond Tutu was uh, uh, the Bishop of Johannesburg then, and they said, well, if you're still feeling this, we will send you for theological formation uh, uh, to college. And then I went there for three years uh, in Grahamstown, and uh, there was a process of, of discernment again. And after that process, the church felt uh, maybe they can take a chance. <laughs> and uh, I, got, I got ordained. And, Again, as I say, it's still a process of discernment. I, I still go back home. I still inter, interface with the Makovas. I see the current king. We, we share perspectives on different things. And then within the church, um, I'm happy. I couldn't be anywhere else but to serve uh, God and the church and, and the nations uh, in his vocation. Great. Many, many of our mm. young people, mm. um, even older than 40, 50, 60, mm. Mm. Um, do not, mm. have not experienced mm. um, the Don Pass. Mm. Could mm. you give us a sense of mm. 
mm. of the what the Dompas characterized at the mm. time as mm. a lesson yeah. for to the present and the future. Yeah, yeah uh, Dompas was really a uh, very demeaning uh, to of influx control and of of uh, um, entrenching uh, apartheid and racial discrimination. Um, we, we were given very funny categories uh, that uh, you are black uh, uh, African uh, from the homelands, so you don't belong there. Uh, so you'll get section 181B, so you're allowed to come into, into Johannesburg and, and work, but you have to return home. Or if you are born in, in Johannesburg and um, you, uh, you happen to be black, you're given a section 181A, uh, then at least you can move around uh, there. And then uh, women initially didn't have to carry dumpers, then they had to carry dumpers, and we have to carry those dumpers uh, around. And uh, white people didn't carry dumpers. And then, then they started saying, okay, Let's take it also to the so-called uh, uh, colored people. And then for Alex, where there were Chinese, Indian, colored, blacks, uh, Zimbabweans, and everybody, uh, when the Dompas was introduced, it just created unnecessary uh, divisions among the people that used to, uh, to live together. And so the Dompas was this green, uh, initially brownish, uh, grayish book that you had to carry and if you are black and the police stop you, you have to produce it. And it, it was not uh, good enough. It has to say, do you have section 181A, then you're OK. If it's 181B, they check it. When did you last go back home? You say, oh, no, 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 no. Then they stamp it. They give you 40, what, 72 hours uh, to leave um, uh, Johannesburg. And uh, it was very very traumatic. So um, uh, that is why we really appreciate it. Uh, even before us, the struggle by the women that walked to, uh, to Parliament, Lillian Ngoi, Helen Suzman, and those that went and banned uh, and the passes. Uh, but if you banned the passes, you were really challenging the state because it was the state machinery of maiming and killing our aspirations and ambitions as black people. Given all those experiences mm. that you've gone through from mm. childhood. I just want to take it out. Okay. Okay. <coughs> uh, okay, okay, okay. Or should I put it on my lap? No, no, just okay. put it. You can actually put it on your oh, lap. On my lap, I'm okay. Much closer now. Okay, okay. <coughs> is it all right? Or is it? Okay. Thank you. Mm. Given, given those experiences, mm. um, on the one hand, mm. the, the traditional influence, mm. then the priesthood, mm. the liberation struggle, mm. um, and then your own experience as a young person mm. with the machinery mm. and the tools of the apartheid state, mm. what were the influences on your life? What were the three mm. important influences mm. that makes up Tabo? Mm. So, so, Mahova, the Archbishop. Okay. I think the critical one uh, is uh, the word courage. Uh, you, you know, the word courage sums up uh, individuals and events and, and things that we're engaged in. I mean, uh, maybe somebody, some people will say we were reckless, <laughs> mm -hmm. but we all had a sense of purpose. Uh, we plucked up courage and said, uh, apartheid is wrong, segregation is wrong, um, um, allowing uh, the minority to really uh, boss us is wrong. But we were not vengeful. Uh, I mean, we, we hid some of the uh, Jewish students um, who were conscientious ob objectors who didn't want to go to the army. We hid them in our townships. Um, when we had theological college, um, we, when I remember Ivan Toms, uh, who came and addressed us as a conscientious objector. He was uh, welcomed in, in, into that. And um, 
So we were courageous, and which is really what I hope uh, the new generation, the generation now, and our generation could continue uh, to be uh, courageous in challenging inequality, in challenging uh, unemployment, in challenging everything that is uh, before us, not only in South Africa, but the world over. The second thing is uh, courage was embodied by the likes, as I said, of uh, um, Oliver Tambo, uh, Desmond Tutu, uh, uh, Nelson Mandela. And I was part, as, as I said, of the Release Mandela campaign and some of the, of the missions and things that we did um, were stupid, <laughs> if, if I may say so, but they also built on courage. And, and the, third, sorry, the, 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 the third one is uh, hope. Uh, sorry, the second one is hope. Um, we, 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 we sang. I mean, struggle songs were mainly about we shall overcome. And one day, deep in our hearts, we do believe an American a spiritual song. Um, uh, we used to sing very deeply spiritual songs. And then in our, what, what have we done? And um, uh, we met uh, also, and uh, we, we, we organized ourselves into street committees. Um, and so that sense of hope uh, was rekindled. We also had fun. I mean, we, uh, we, we invited the OJs, we invited the other people to come and um, uh, entertain us. We took the struggle songs. Um, wrote them, we took the, our longings, we had uh, the poets um, um, t t talking about uh, uh, the struggle. And then the, the last one was just the selflessness of, of, of the people that were involved. It was not only ourselves. The um, uh, release Mandela campaign, the uh, artists abroad uh, who supported uh, our cause, the churches abroad, the shoes, the mosques. So our struggle uh, didn't just become an internal South African thing. Uh, that international focus was there. The church in Sweden, the South African Council of Churches uh, were there. So uh, perhaps we need to learn from how uh, we struggled um, mm -hmm. when we become navel gazing in South Africa. So those are the three things, really. Uh, you, mm. you, you're mentioning mm. a number of mm. important people mm. in the history of South Africa. Mm. Um, what was the main source of inspiration for you? Mm. Mm. Uh, from the people? From um, Archbishop Tutu. Okay. Um, you mentioned Nelson Mandela. Yeah. Mm. You mentioned the works of uh, mm. Ivan Toms. Yes, yes. Um, and others. Mm. What, what was the main inspiration? I think the main... The ins common thing between all of them. Yeah, the common thing <coughs> amongst all of them was just this courage, courage. You know, this courage that is lacking nowadays. I mean, we fear so much. We fear our political leaders. We fear our business leaders. We fear our chiefs. Uh, well, that, that fear is not really without foundations because uh, nowadays those that are courageous, they get... Uh, punished and sidelined. But uh, even in those days, um, these three I mean, had an amazing sense of courage. And that courage just moved them to contribute to something bigger than, them, than themselves. They were selfless. We could call it selfless courage, mm -hmm. um, so to speak. Mm. Has, has the constitutional mm. democracy demobilized mm. people's courageous events, courageous mm. efforts? Um, to to take on uh, power as they see mm. uh, that it's not using the interests of the mm. citizens at all, mm. as a whole. Mm. I, I think constitutional democracy um, uh, is playing its role, and uh, we must accept that as South Africans, we we are learning uh, how to operate within a constitutional democracy. I don't think constitutional democracy is taking uh, root as much as it ought to uh, because there are radical um, uh, values, if I may come from a value perspective, 
within uh, our, our constitution. I mean, uh, the values of respect for the dignity of the other, the values of freedom, uh, uh, the values of, of dignity. And in our preamble, we have covenanted with each other that we will never do the atrocities and, um, uh, of, uh, and the, the injustices of the past. But um, those things uh, continue uh, because uh, people have been elected and they, they think they have the rights and the votes uh, uh, to, to steal the people's money, uh, to uh, create inequality, uh, to deploy uh, cadres, and, uh, and to, serve, to be self-serving. And so the practice of constitutional democracy is not yielding the, the hope, uh, the dividends that we thought uh, we will get, abundant life for all, um, bridging um, uh, inequality. But constitutional democracy is not wrong in itself, but we just need to make it work. At the moment, it hasn't taken uh, full root. I mean, if constitutional democracy enables us to elect a president and from a constitutional process and a democratic process, a priv a public purse is used to fund his private home. And then through the constitutional um, democratic processes, his party can vote and then just veto uh, the consequences of that. So you can see that we still need to understand the values and the moral imperative of a constitutional um, a democracy. Mm. I'm going to come back mm. To, mm. To, to that question that mm. you, the mm. point that you're raising. Mm. Could you just tell us what, mm. is, what, what, are, what are the challenges that you, mm. you're experiencing mm. um, as the leader of the Anglican Church mm. in South Africa, mm. um, in society, mm. in your interaction with different mm. interests, mm. whether it's business, whether it's mm people within government, mm. within legislature, but it's the ordinary mm. citizens, if mm. you like, yeah. within South Africa. What are the chances mm. that, that presents itself mm. to you as the leader of the yeah. Anglican Church? Yeah. Also I, inside your own church? Inside my own church. I, I think the main challenges are, and we need to declare that as a, an emergency and a crisis, youth unemployment. Uh, that is a major, major, major crisis. We have a number of youth that pass matric with uh, very doubtful symbols and they don't get into FETs, uh, they don't have money to go into universities and what they do, uh, they, um, uh, they sit and then what then happens is we have inequality of opportunity because uh, without qualification you won't be able to get the requisite skill and in our days, we used to have Ambach schools, that is trade schools. And um, Kara Esmal, bless his soul, did away with the trade schools. Uh, he merged a number of other universities. And then we had uh, OBE, which has now been dumped. So what we need to do is perhaps go back into having trade schools so that we could train the youth of today to have skills that are needed in industry or skills that can make them to create their own employment. So that is the number one challenge that we're facing, youth unemployment. And we need to mobilize our youth, uh, lest they get into all sorts of things, drugs, and join the likes of um, maybe ISIS or other, other movements because they want to belong. The other thing really is, um, I think, the price of, of corruption. Um, you know, from time to time, I write an email to the youth of our church and uh, to uh, parishioners in our church, and I ask them to uh, say what are the issues that are dealing with uh, right now. So, the last six months, uh, people have been expressing their concerns about corruption. Uh, they are saying life is moving so fast, and I can't believe that they are not living in it. Mm -hmm. And um, the price of corruption 
is causing inequality. Uh, yesterday, I led that um, anti-corruption march uh, where speaker after speaker uh, uh, quantified uh, what corruption is doing, how many billions have been lost uh, due to corruption uh, since our democratic South Africa. Former President Mbeki uh, completed that uh, study on how many illicit uh, money, um, or illegal money, leaves uh, the continent annually due, due to corruption. Um, so um, youth unemployment, corruption, um, are really the key, key uh, issues uh, that people normally uh, discuss about and the unintended consequences or the intended consequences is uh, inequality of opportunity. Mm. Many, many people mm. uh, overwhelmingly agree with you, mm. but there are also powerful people who disagree mm. with you. Yeah. How do you, as a leader, how do you manage mm. the, the, the powerful mm. disagreement with you on a range mm. of issues? Mm including the ones that you are raising yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. How do you manage mm. the, the, those mm. discontent with mm. you at yeah. different levels? Yeah. No, no, no I, 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 mean, I, I agree. I mean, um, one uh, public one was when I preached at um, uh, Mrs. Sisulu's uh, uh, funeral at, uh, at Orlando Stadium and uh, President Zuma um, and his cabinet uh, were on stage uh, Mrs. Sisulu uh, is an Anglican, and she had expressed that she really wanted some form of a, a church service. And, but she was accorded a, a state or semi-state funeral. So the state was involved. So, and the state didn't know what to do uh, with uh, these church people. And uh, we, we, we dug our heels. And we said, you will have your time, and the church will have its say. And then there was a question of, now, who speaks first, uh, the president of the country or the archbishop? And we said, now, this is a church service. It may be in the stadium. The archbishop will speak last. So the president spoke, and I spoke. And of course, what I said was not uh, palatable. And then, well, Julius Malema then was still the, the radical youth <laughs> within the ANC. And I've, I was booed in public, so I understand what they mean when they say this. And, uh, uh, they said the sermon was long, and then as I continued, uh, they started saying, hey, the change, Archbishop. Uh, it's because they didn't want uh, to hear what I was saying, and I dug my heels, and I, I, I had to say what I had to say, um, so, and I finished. So you, you don't have to take things personal. Uh, mm -hmm. People do, do challenge you, some jokingly. I, mean, I met one senior uh, politician who said, um, Hey, Archbishop, you know, the stuff that you say, I mean, we don't like. And we see you're not wearing a helmet on your head. We, from our movement, we will we'll stone you. Um, I know it's a joke, but um, uh, those are some of the things where people are expressing discontent. Some write openly. I mean, I wrote in the Sunday Independent uh, criticizing uh, the way the country is headed and, and criticizing, in particular, uh, the president. And um, uh, the ruling party asked the former minister of Cuba, uh, sorry, uh, ambassador of Cuba, uh, to write an open letter to the Archbishop uh, responding to, uh, to the article. And some of them are gracious enough. Um, uh, when we disagree, they come here, we sit down, we, we unpack um, the differences, uh, we agree to disagree, uh, and then we move on, and then in seven days' time, uh, this whole place uh, on the grounds here will be full of all the mining CEOs yeah, uh, in the country and some from, from abroad. And I've asked the people of faith uh, to come and have what I call courageous uh, conversations where we, from uh, the faith uh, perspective, uh, discuss with the mining houses and some unions, uh, rival unions, and um, and some people from government, uh, particularly from the mineral um, uh, the department, um, to look at ways in which we can um, create wealth, but respect the planet and respect the people. So I'm looking forward to that. So 
So we do it. Um, we are open. We get criticized. Don't take things uh, personal. And then, as you know, sociologists say from Habermas, if you enter into the public space and you criticize others, when they criticize you back, don't be a crybaby. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mm. You, you carried on from yeah. the Masa Sulu, Abu yeah. Tina Masa Sulu's yes. funeral, yes. into Zulaki's funeral. Yes. With the same message. Yes. Mm. Um, on the one hand, showing consistency, on mm. the other hand, mm. um, making sure that the message gets through to, mm. to the, the broader interests of South African society. Mm. Mm. And how Abutina Sassouli and Zulaki yeah. yes. um, played quite an exemplary role mm. in that. Mm. Why you? Why were you mm. insistent on, mm. on, on the same message mm. from Orlando Stadium mm. to uh, the Johannesburg? Okay. It's Zulaki's funeral. Yeah. I, I, I think if you look at both of them, I mean, they were people of integrity and um, they were accountable. Um, um, during the struggle, and really, I was amplifying the fact that um, you know, accountable democracy uh, should characterize who who we are. Um, we can't just uh, you know fluff things uh, and and cheat because we belong to the ruling party, or we or we belong to a particular business, or we are chiefs. Uh, stealing is a stealing and. It, it's time that we name it. It is unpalatable, but we had to name it. They were also uh, selfless. And um, maybe they I also become very parochial. Uh, <laughs> they are my parishioners. Uh, they are Anglican. They were raised understanding the church's uh, social teaching of always trying to serve the common good. And in that message, I was just really being a mirror to myself, a mirror to the family, and a mirror to uh, um, the political heads. Um, they both belong to the ANC, and I knew that they were held in high regard, and that the president was going to be there, and that the cabinet was going to be there, and that hopefully they'll hear the message. But interestingly enough, um, they were more angry at, at Zolakia's a funeral than at Masi Sulu. Maybe there was no Julius Malema to say, um, <laughs> change, change. change. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and even the minister, Lindu Sulu, um, who was in defense then, um, passed a little comment and said, hey, uh, Archbishop, uh, today you are boiling flames. Uh, <laughs> But we have to say it because it's not about really me, it's about uh, holding the country accountable, being a mirror, uh, showing that courageous leadership is not about just talk, it's also walking the talk. Mm. Mm. So what would you, what would be a, um, one of your lessons be for the current leadership mm. in business? Mm. You can take one by one business, yeah. in politics, and civil society. Mm. Let me start with business. Um, you know, business South Africa used to be so involved, so engaged. I know we don't recognize them as much as uh, we need to. Um, after all, well, they, 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 they benefited and maybe uh, some people say maybe their intentions were also profit motivated. But business South Africa organized themselves during apartheid, and a few Africans, uh, business leaders, and uh, a number of others went to Lusaka, and they met the ANC in Lusaka, and they said, apartheid is just too costly. This thing is not working out. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the things <laughs> that we could quietly negotiate on? I mean, uh, maybe the, the ANC also maybe negotiated too much. Um, what are some of the things we could negotiate on? And th those negotiations, um, uh, continued and they, they to some extent, uh, affirmed uh, the then politicians to say, I mean, if the ANC can talk with business people and the business people are running apartheid South Africa, uh, maybe we need to talk because if we don't talk, the business people also won't support 
uh, uh, this, this machinery. And uh, my call really is for business South Africa. It is organized, but it is numb, it is dumb, it is not being heard, it is quiet. And again, we're going to say business, where were you when a democratic process created inequality, when the democratic process maimed and made a number of South Africans to be hungry. So we're calling the voice of business uh, to speak up and to act up. And I hope these courageous conversations that we've started with the mining houses will spill into the other uh, sectors and that business will find its voice again and hold the government accountable. Because at the moment, I think Business South Africa is happy to quietly uh, uh, be co-opted. They are so scared uh, and they are uh, ineffective. All they do is they throw a lot of money into corporate social responsibility and they wash their hands. They've put, as you know, a lot of money into this education trust uh, to support schools. It is lots of millions. And Masana was the first CEO. Masana has just stepped down. Money has been collected in the name of business. Has any sense been used? Zero. It is their money. They need to speak up. They need to act out. When it comes to civil society... But on the, yes. on the business, okay. aren't, yeah. you, mm. aren't you being naive mm. as, mm. as mm. one of the key leaders mm. to expect business yeah. Yeah. to mm. stand up and speak out mm. against mm. Uh, the political leadership, mm. if you like, mm. Mm. or against certain interests, yeah. mm. or even mm. against mm. practices of corruption, mm. when many claims are being made that mm. business in itself, mm. through the yeah. system of mm. market yeah. behavior, mm. Mm. have also been guilty mm. Mm. Yeah. of white collar crime, yeah. um, mm. of corruption, mm. Mm. Um, and of basically yeah. behaving like mm. typical oligarchs within the system of yeah. control. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I think you're right. You're right. Uh, it's not as neat as I've put it. Uh, but, but the reality is not all businesses are like that. Mm -hmm. You know, there are businesses that have signed to what we call unashamedly ethical. And I'm maybe mainly appealing to those to say, you can't just sign to the code of unashamedly ethical and then just continue business as usual. Right. You have to leave the ethical demands that you've signed up to. And I always, I mean, yesterday at the march, I said, um, just to support what you say, corruption in a simple mathematical formula is, is the corrupter and the corruptee equals corruption. And in many instances, the government has allowed itself to be corrupted by business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we, as civil society, have allowed that to happen. But if business speaks up, let me continue the line of mining to say, government, we do want our licenses to mine. We do pay for a license. And we do have uh, the mining charter that regulates how we should, over and above mining, uh, uh, do certain things around the communities. And we pay you for that portion. And you're not playing your part in terms of uh, building there. Uh, we're going to hold you accountable to those parts where there are clear legal contracts where you don't come to the party rather than be scared of losing the mining license. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure two or three will lose and the investors won't be happy. But I think if two or three stand up and say so, uh, the government um, level in that case of, of um, honesty uh, will increase. Of course, uh, business um, sometimes doesn't care. Okay. Um, they're interested in profit. Um, they... They will bribe, they will pay. I mean, I'm following with interest uh, the claims that Chancellor House, of, owned by the ANC, has benefited from Hitachi in order to build Midupi, 
uh, using lots of money. Hitachi has paid the fine uh, um, uh, abroad. If, if Hitachi has paid the fine abroad, uh, what are the implications for ANC here? What happened uh, mm -hmm. to those uh, millions of, of money that are supposedly paid to Chancellor House? So there are some of those uh, oligarchs, uh, multinational companies that will, will pay and corrupt. And we need to go deeper and also address uh, those, uh, expose them. Uh, <laughs> your institution will come in handy there in terms of helping us to have the tools of, uh, of researching because we can no longer uh, speaking as uh, uh, prophets, uh, just shoot from intuition. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we need to go uh, uh, deeper. Mm. Mm. Civil society leadership mm. is in disarray. Yeah, yeah. What was, what's your view about that? No, no, that's 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 so true. Um, what happened is um, the democratic South Africa um, recruited. Uh, our chancellors, our university administrators, uh, leaders of civil society. Uh, some are holding a good posts within government and some have just left now, re recruited by the private sector. And, um, and the comrades have tasted power. Mm -hmm. And the comrades were uh, on the ground as members of civil society uh, before. And that has left a, a gap uh, within the civil society movement. And again, let me just take one um, uh, example just to prove my point. Um, the, the, the churches and members of civil society uh, used to benefit um, uh, money from the Global Fund to deal with HIV and AIDS and TB. And they used to benefit as principal recipients uh, from the Global Fund together with government. And what government has said now through the South African National AIDS Council, or SANAC, they've put money into one pot and they've systematically marginalized uh, everyone out. And now we are making an appeal to Deputy President Ramaphosa as the chairperson of um, SANAC to intervene. Now they want now the last ecumenical body and uh, no longer to be a principal recipient. So that money goes into the government and the government uh, instituted NGOs. So NGOs are springing up that uh, somehow are related to government officials in order to do AIDS and HIV and TB work. And that example shows how civil society organizations that have been very vocal have been marginalized TAC was on the verge of being closed um, um, last year, the treatment action campaign. They went with a massive uh, fundraising strategy because the government uh, systematically closed its support and closed um, mm -hmm. its recommendation of uh, external funders uh, for, for TAC. So we are in total disarray because financially we are being squeezed out. But we also have ourselves to be blamed um, when democracy came, including the churches, we all said, oh, the comrades are in charge. Mm -hmm. uh, there's democracy now. We can sit, enjoy, become insular, be looking at how do we do a mission in the church? How do I build my own NGO mm -hmm. uh, to be the most powerful? And then we're working in silo. And maybe the struggle that we're going through now is very good. It will force us to go back into uh, being the strong civil society voice uh, that we used to be. So what are the things that needs to happen to restore mm. the leadership in civil society? I it's think, just, it's sorry. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I'm just framing again. Mm. Okay. I think the things that will be helpful to restore the voice of civil society will be one, I mean, I was most encouraged by that march yesterday. Um, NEDLEC didn't give um, the unions permission to have an unprotected strike. Or in fact, they postponed the decision to um, the 14th of this month. And then civil society organizations said, well, we're not doing this because the, the workers are here. 
we're going to go into the street and um, protest against uh, uh, corruption. And we have challenged ourselves at March that just uh, protesting on the streets as an event is not good enough. We need to have these protests almost every month and we need to have a program of action that seek to address um, uh, corruption and we need to work together and we need to commit uh, even if we are civil societies in silo to a program of action like corruption that uh, we can work on uh, together and we need to approach uh, funders like Open so uh, Society Foundation to say is there a fund that you could put aside for coordinated civil society actions rather than you, you funding the Mail and Guardian, three million funding, Archbishop Mokoba Trust, one million funding, Desmond Tutu Foundation, 500,000 you funding so and so. Um, why don't you create a fund that will enable civil society to have these pickets, uh, to have uh, a good research, um, as we root out corruption and, e and inequality, and to work uh, uh, together, and not only that, but to publish uh, some of these findings, to publish uh, some of the gains uh, from these marches, and to encourage uh, uh, almost like street committees. We were formed in street committees to discuss uh, uh, these issues uh, within street committees. And I think therein lies the possibility of resuscitating um, the strong voice of civil society, but without the courage and the neck to do this thing, it will just be words, 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 and words, and no action. What is your assessment mm. of the... Because clearly it's a relationship between mm. business leaders mm. and people mm. in civil society mm. And, mm. and political leaders. Mm. Um, what's your assessment of political leadership? across the political parties mm. in, in South Africa. Mm. And what are the key things mm. that you were saying mm. we need to mm. focus on? Mm. I think um, we, we're still learning <laughs> in South Africa. We still, even if we say we're a constitutional democracy and we've got uh, multi parties um, in, 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 in our parliament, um, we still have a mentality of winner takes takes all, mm -hmm. and um, if uh, things don't go the way of um, the ruling party, uh, you see a sense of, of unease. Uh, that is why I was saying, uh, not that I'm, uh, I'm an archbishop, I have to critique all of them, but I looked with interest uh, the by-election in Port Elizabeth, a stronghold of the ANC when MDM, uh, won uh, uh, that ward. Um, uh, we, we, we need a system like that. We need to encourage uh, uh, independent uh, candidates uh, in South Africa. I know it's very expensive to, to register, but we need to encourage independent uh, candidates uh, uh, to make our, our parliament more colorful. We may need to revisit uh, the whole system of uh, the ruling party uh, electing uh, the president of the country. Is there no way of electing a president of the country uh, through a different system and uh, the president is not necessarily bound by um, what his political office is saying, mm -hmm. um, but is there to serve the interests of the country? Um, and I think the opposition party uh, in, in South Africa uh, could do more together because if you really put them together, I mean they uh, constitute quite a sizable uh, uh, unit. Uh, they could work together in terms of policy formulation, in terms of uh, maybe holding uh, themselves and the others um, uh, accountable in, in ensuring that those wonderful policies are translated uh, where they need to be translated because we've got wonderful policies that they all say yay to, and, um, and nobody cares about uh, their implementation. An interesting um, one, again, going back to the mining context, is the 
motion that was passed uh, in, in, in Parliament by the EFF that sought to tell lawmen that they are a, a useless uh, um, um, uh, a mining company. Uh, in Parliament, I'm told that if uh, one political party proposes uh, uh, a motion and it is supported by the other, um, it, it carries. And now there's this motion uh, that now Parliament was discussing retrospectively to say, we can't tell lawmen that they are useless based on, on EFF and representing the Parliament of South Africa. Now there's talk of how do we rescind uh, that motion instead of telling lawmen. I'm saying our politicians um, could be much more vigilant. They could um, really look at what are some of the things that they can do together and stop this thing that every administration comes with its own director general, its own deputy director general every five years. We're starting from scratch and uh, there doesn't seem to be any continuity uh, uh, here in terms of the ruling party. But equally, I find that the divisions uh, within uh, the small organizations, it's, it's, it's not good uh, for our democracy. It entrenches um, the dominance of the ruling party. I've got nothing against the ruling party, but I'm just saying um, the more the merrier in making South Africa work. In 2015, mm. South Africa, yeah. <coughs> is Parliament still relevant? Mm. In 2015, South Africa, I think Parliament will remain um, relevant for as long as um, the the policies that are looked at there and passed um, have what I call some vertical uh, application. Uh, at the moment, it's like horizontal application of those uh, policies, um, chant policies for the sake of themselves. And this year, we've seen um, um, EFF um, adding an interesting dimension to, uh, to Parliament, really rekindling an interest in a number of people to say, hey, uh, what, is, what is Parliament? Uh, who is the, the official opposition party? Is it EFF or, or, or DA? Um, uh, but Parliament is, becomes very boring uh, when all the time we see on TV, I'm not sure what other things are they doing, um, is about Zuma and Inkandla. We need to be decisive, deal with that thing once and for all, and allow uh, some of the other subcommittees of parliament, which I think they are doing a lot of uh, hard work, subcommittees of parliament to, to wrestle uh, with the issues, to do thorough research, um, which is not just an ivory tower research, but research based on what is really happening uh, on the ground and and and, and meeting the needs of people. But maybe we may need to review whether we need uh, parliament uh, in Cape Town and Pretoria as a whole, or we need to give power and strength to uh, the provincial uh, and, uh, uh, and legislature, mm -hmm. uh, really, and the <coughs> mayoral uh, offices. Uh, uh, that is where uh, the rubber hits the road. Mm. Given your mm. history, in terms of traditional service, mm. priesthood, mm. the liberation struggle, mm. and then your leadership that you've followed through mm. for the last years mm. within the church, in particular within mm. civil society. Mm. What would be the, the key lessons that you would like to impart to mm. the youth on the African mm. continent, mm. and also to those leaders that yeah. have mm. been sitting there for time in memorial yeah. as yeah. president or as premiers mm. or, yeah. Yeah. or as mayors within their own exactly. constituencies? Mm. I think my, my really humble uh, message and urging to uh, the youth uh, of our country is uh, never cease to be a lifeline, a lifelong learner. Um, <coughs> never cease or tire from bettering yourself and equipping yourself. Uh, that is, uh, for me, uh, very foundational. And 
I've literally also just grabbed the might and the scruff of the Anglican Church uh, and said education ministry is primary. We are planting schools, we are supporting schools, open bursaries for schools, for children at tertiary education. So education, education, education. But I always get asked, education for what? So it can't just be education for its own sake. So gather the requisite skills so that we can be part of the solution to the challenges that we are facing uh, today. Don't fold your arms and expect somebody to do it for yourself. Mm. Get involved, involved, get your hands dirty. Make the little change. If you are unemployed, start a small business, pick up uh, that rubble, recycle it, go ahead and sell it. And um, if you, you need education, congregate in your mosques, shoes, churches, uh, invite uh, those that are doing it to come and mentor you so that you, you, you can move forward. And to the youth, really, of Africa as a whole. Uh, Africa is beautiful. Um, and as Tavon Beggy says, uh, I'm an African. I, mean, I wouldn't be anywhere else in the world. I see it when I travel abroad occasionally. Um, when I cross into um, Africa, and, and particularly when you fly over the equator, I feel that pool that brings me home. So be grounded, uh, love your country, love your continent, um, be vigilant. Um, um, don't navel gaze, don't underestimate yourselves, um, don't always look to China and the other places. Yes, we're part of the international world, but make African solutions um, for our African problems. And, and then lastly, I'm saying, be courageous. We need that courage. Um, to make these changes uh, happen. And so, hopefully my ministry has been characterized by the need to better myself and the need uh, to speak up and to speak out and to act up. So, if you, based on what you said, what, what would stand out as the key characteristics mm. of somebody that's a leader in the service of the people? Mm. I think what are the key things that people must be on the lookout for when they say, Daniel or Pete mm. is a servant leader? Mm. I think they need to look at Daniel's ability to learn. Daniel must always use every opportunity as a learning exercise. And somebody who is that way inclined makes themselves vulnerable because they know that they do not have the total picture. The total picture is formed when all of us bring different perspective and together we move forward. So they need to be able to open themselves to learning. They need to be vulnerable, but they need to be selfless. They need to contribute far beyond what will benefit them directly. It's basically what we call the common good in the church. What we call, um, if I may narrow it down to biblical values, in John 10, verse 10, we say Christ came so that we may have life in abundance. So you call it abundant life. And abundant life is enabled by leaders who ensure that every voice is heard and everyone participates um, in what God is up to uh, uh, in their world. So those are really uh, some of the characteristics um, that um, I can define as seven leaders. Willingness to learn, willingness to serve, and w willingness to be vulnerable, 
and willingness to serve the common good and to shape the destiny of those that you serve. Finally, mm -hmm. what would be your message for the president and future presidents mm -hmm. um, of South Africa mm -hmm. in, in the service of the mm -hmm. people? Because yeah. that's essentially why they get voted into office. Exactly. To serve its, their citizens. Exactly. I think my message to uh, President Zuma, uh, uh, to the presidents um, and the leaders of Africa, to future presidents, uh, is uh, the truth will set you free. So in whatever you do, try to pursue that which is truthful, that which is honest, that which is honorable. So that's my message to President Zuma. So if you've, if, if there are corruptive activities mm. happening, mm. would you then say that the leadership of a country has lost mm. its moral campus? I, I, I would uh, with no doubt say so, that if there are corrupt activities happening and were so committed by them, or in their name. I will say the leadership of the country has lost its moral compass. And how do they reset their moral compass? You can't reset it if you've strayed. The people of the country need to speak up and demand the truth, demand accountability, demand that they be respected and reset the compass themselves to say, hey, let's just use one tool that has put you into that office. Maybe not the religious, not um, some other thing. Let's use the constitutional values that have put you in that, in that place. The constitutional values are very clear that you've been put by people and you will account, you will respect, you will ensure that those that are the poorest, neediest, those that are unable, uh, their socioeconomic rights are, are met. So in whatever decisions that you've made on nuclear power, on any other dealings, on Gandla, on whatever, what constitutional values have you considered? What have you based your moral direction on and your decisions? And so you're right, um, if there's um, the cancerous uh, corruption, uh, the leaders uh, have lost their moral compass and we are letting them do that. And we need to speak up. Mm. Archbishop, thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. <coughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And good luck. Good luck with the project. Thank you. Can I just ask you